And I am now going to um, pass the screen over to my colleague, Johanna Thumb, who is our program manager um, of student engagement at Vector, who will be moderating our panel. Thank you so much, Melissa. Uh, so it is now my distinct pleasure to introduce our four wonderful wonderful panelists here today who have just popped on screen. Uh, first, we have Dr. Saba Vahid, who is a group manager of data and decision sciences um, at Ontario Health, formerly Cancer Care Ontario, where she oversees the development and implementation of analytics tools for clinical program partners within the organization. Uh, she holds a PhD in operations research from the University of British Columbia, and her areas of expertise include optimization and simulation modeling, uh, which are utilized to address planning and prediction questions in Ontario's healthcare system. Um, our second panelist here today is Mike Bills, who is the Program Integration Lead of AI and Digital Health at Roche. Um, he's a background in science and engineering from the University of Ottawa, where he worked in research and product engineering with a few biotech startups early in his career. Uh, upon earning his MBA from U of T, um, he joined a global management consulting firm and led strategy and analytics engagements with a variety of healthcare companies worldwide. Um, he's held roles in marketing, commercial operations, and product development within Roche, and now he's focused on enabling transformative potential that AI and digital technologies offer, uh, not only within this organization, but also for healthcare system partners and for patients. Um, our third panelist is Dr. Fradish Kodakarami, who is a computer scientist and machine learning researcher at Cyclica, where she's tasked with developing and maintaining machine learning software. Uh, she's a background in machine learning, software development, and algorithm design uh, with a PhD in computer science from Tehran Polytechnic University, uh, where her dissertation focused on theoretical computer science. Um, she also has experience applying computer vision and deep learning approaches in the context of healthcare data, including genomics and radiological images, where, and she also completed her postdoctoral fellowship at Princess Margaret Cancer Care uh, Research Center and the University of Toronto. Um, and last but not least, we have the wonderful Carrie Weinberg, who is VP Data at League, uh, which is North America's leading health operating system, uh, powering the digital transformation of healthcare. Her team is responsible for building and enhancing um, Leaks FHIR native da data platform, developing and deploying predictive models to rec recommend to users how best to engage in their health, and empowering data driven customers and partners. So, before joining Leak, um, Carrie led the data science and engineering team for Amgen's digital health innovation, where her team applied machine learning to better understand human disease and improve ability to reach patients. Um, she also has an MBA and Master of Science in Biological Engineering from MIT, and she also uh, holds a Bachelor of Science in Biological Engineering also from MIT. So thank you and welcome to all our panelists here today. Uh, without further ado, let's get into some questions. Uh, so my first question is a bit of a long one. Our panelists here today work across both the public and private sectors, um, as well as many different areas of health. So as you heard from the introductions, there's pharmaceuticals, there's wellness. Uh, I'm sure our audience today, which are mostly graduate students in AI, um, as well as alumni in AI, are wondering what type of work is being done at your organizations, uh, particularly as they are mapping out their own career pathways. Um, could you share maybe a recent project or use case that your organization is working on in health and AI? Um, so maybe I will start with just whoever is on my screen first, Osaba. Thank you. Um, thanks for the introduction and uh, really happy to be here. Um, so maybe, yeah, maybe I can talk a little bit about what the team does. So just, I mean, a disclaimer, we are just embarking on kind of doing more AI ML in Ontario Health. Like our, our, our team basically, like historically has been doing a lot of more like operations research, I would say heavy the projects. As, and again, kind of just uh, to take a step back, Cancer Care Ontario, the legacy agency, the really the a mandate was to, to plan at the provincial level. So a lot of kind of funding and planning resource, like capacity planning type uh, kind of models and, and, and questions that were being answered. Um, as the, all the agencies are now coming together, we have access to a lot more data. So as in case you don't know, Ontario Health is an amalgamation of 20 kind of uh, previous agencies within, within Ontario. Um, we now have data beyond just kind of cancer and renal of chronic conditions, we have access to a lot more data, but a lot of kind of uh, uh, privacy considerations before you can link all of that data and make 
make decisions or use them for, for model development. Um, what uh, our team does, I would say more in the data science, like kind of beyond operations research is uh, more heavily, I would say rooted in stats, like really strong stats and biostats type questions. Um, we, uh, like some of the, some of the more kind of, I guess, um, common um, um, ML techniques that we've used is around uh, clustering uh, type kind of uh, questions. Again, we're not the work at Ontario that at least so far has not really focused on patient level outcome prediction. So it's more at the system level. So trying to, uh, one of the recent projects that we've done, there are multiple computations that have come out of it and more will come out is um, around uh, looking at concordance of patients with disease pathways. So ideal pathways that patients should potentially follow to get better clinical outcomes. There's been uh, kind of um, uh, over the past few years work around if you actually do follow a certain pathway, you know, we've shown that you have better outcomes. Um, now, in terms of figuring out how, who these patients are and why they are, you know, why you are seeing they're more concordant or less or less concordant, um, there's a bit of, you know, just digging around in the results and trying to figure out if, if we can somehow cluster these patients together to figure out if there are certain characteristics that binds them together. Uh, and that could potentially help uh, targeted policies around what we can do to make patients more concordant. Um, so that, that has been one thing. We've also done um, some just looking at kind of performance of specific hospitals or providers around um, uh, their kind of patients that, you know, the patients that stay in hospitals when they are kind of, when they don't really need the resources at the hospital, they're called alternative level of care patients in Ontario, if you are familiar with the term. But, but it's a big concern about patients using resources that are not necessary anymore. So you're, um, you want to kind of discharge these patients to the most appropriate care setting that's not necessarily in an acute hospital. So hospitals um, kind of perform uh, differently in Ontario, across Ontario. You have hospitals that are doing really well and those who are not. So there was also a, a kind of an investigations around, you know, can you again cluster these, you know, hospitals together based on a range of kind of variables and if you can say something about that performance. Um, there is a lot of interest in doing NLP type kind of work on pathology data. We have not really embarked on that yet, um, but uh, again, a wealth of data, relatively new in terms of actually embarking on it. And we are trying to make kind of partnerships with actually Vector with some other kind of companies to try to um, kind of start growing <laughs> that capacity at Ontario Health. Sorry, I think. I talk too long, but yeah. No, that was a great summary. Thank you, Sava. Um, over to you, Farnoosh. We actually in Ciplica also, we uh, work on drug discovery and it's a combination of drug discovery and uh, machine learning and uh, both, uh, let's say that, um, Biophysics and machine learning are using in our company. And uh, there are lots of platforms that we are, are working on, uh, such as Ligand Express, Ligand Design, and uh, let's say Matchmaker, Poem. Uh, the last uh, platform that I work on, and uh, if I want to explain that uh, by more detail, it's, uh, let's say that it's a Matchmaker, which is a, which is a, a platform that uh, that is a drug target prediction uh, and uh, uh, and it's the combination of uh, finding the best match uh, between the ligands and uh, pockets in the proton and uh, we it just uh, it's a uh, it's a neural network on the uh, on the uh, ligand data and also proton data that we just want to predict the um, uh, the, um, the matching between these uh, ligand and target uh, ligand and targets. And uh, in our company, there are lots of uh, chemists and also machine learning developers that we are we uh, we work on these uh, plat different platforms. Great, thank you so much. Uh, how about you, Mike? Oh, uh, yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, 
So it's really interesting. I, so I'll, I'll point out that Roche is not only one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies in the world, but also one of the biggest diagnostics companies in the world. So I can relate very closely to um, Brendan's uh, presentation early, earlier. Obviously, there's a huge part of our organization that's focused on similar type of work, whether in RNA therapeutics or across the board, all, all sorts of different types uh, of therapeutics. So that's a fascinating space in terms of uh, sort of researching the, the leading edge of a, of a disease and what's driving a certain disease area, uh, as well as what might be uh, a useful way of, of approaching treatment of, of that disease. Um, so there's that discovery end of the organization and, and tons of AI applications are, are, are really changing the equation in terms of um, how you think about that uh, um, that whole part of the business for drug discovery. It, it, on the one hand, makes things way faster, like Brendan pointed out. Um, it also makes things way more targeted um, in terms of the, the patient population that you can, um, you, you can focus a drug towards. So cancer is a great domain where you can talk about chemotherapy, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, which was, you know, a, a fairly a broad approach to treating a, a, an overall uh, illness. Um, and what you learn over time as you learn more about cancer um, is every person's cancer is very unique. And so you can get more and more and more targeted and get better and better outcomes with less and less side effects. And that's great, but it also makes for more and more expensive science. So AI can really change that equation to, to aid with the science equation. Um, once you have one of those drugs, um, I think COVID is actually a great highlight to, to, to show um, you know, from the diagnostics organization, we're one of the ones that came up with a, a, the PCR diagnostic test for COVID. Um, but there's limited supply when you come up with a global um, pandemic. And so supply chains get really, really stretched. And so how do you um, manage your, your supply chain globally uh, to, to efficiently um, bring the diagnostic where you need it, when you need it, so it can have the most impact. Um, and similarly with vaccines, therapeutics, et cetera. Um, and so there's all sorts of um, uh, AI applications around population health to anticipate where um, hotspots might be. So we've been doing a lot of work in that space um, to help with supply chain management and so on um, as well. And, uh, and then of course, if you're changing the equation um, for how you um, focus drugs into uh, to individual smaller patient populations, the research doesn't really get that much cheaper, but the market size gets smaller. And so um, it becomes hard to reduce the cost of drugs over time. And so what we need to be looking at is how do you reduce the overall cost of care for patient population, um, despite getting better outcomes with better targeted therapeutics, et cetera. Uh, so we do a lot of work in terms of looking at digital health applications, remote monitoring applications, ways of, of providing good high quality care faster, more conveniently, but without having to go into the really the highest cost way of managing care, which is in a, a tertiary hospital, like uh, one of our big cancer centers, for example. Um, and so I, I think that's in everyone's uh, benefit. So lots of work in, in that domain as well. Amazing, that's great. Uh, over to you, Carrie. Well, it's been really uh, wonderful to hear from a couple of the examples that are shared. It brings me back to my time at Amgen and a lot of the work there. Um, my work at League and my team's work at League is very different. Uh, so at League, we're focused on powering the consumerization of healthcare. How can we support companies from changing how they interact with their consumers in a way that's really compelling and exciting and gets them engaged in their health? So the types of the applications that my team is focused on is much more on how do we serve up the right content, the right service to engage a user? So if you think about that more tactically, that would imply like sequential recommendation systems. And how do we optimize that given the different kinds of activities that users can do um, in terms of managing their health? Is the next best action for them going to be learning about some element of their health that, that they're at risk for? Is it better to have them chat with a nurse? Is it more effective for them to do a steps challenge? Um, and I think that this is a, uh, you know, what we're really focused as, on is how do we make the experience for people to improve their health as exciting and as um, addictive as you know, using Spotify or Netflix. Consumers expect personalization in all the other parts of their life. They expect it as well in terms of how they're accessing, you know, whether they're working with their insurance company, if they're interacting with a retail pharmacy, or they're working with a provider system. Um, and I think that this is a you know, really exciting space for, for data scientists to enter and bring a lot of techniques that um, are more commonly applied in a more consumer-driven experience. So, um, you know, learning, leveraging the learnings from other companies like Spotify and Netflix in terms of how we can best recommend content and services to users. The other opportunity that I'm excited about is 
through our ability to integrate a variety of different data, data sources on our platform, we can do really interesting analysis to find trends. Is it that certain um, individuals that have a given comorbidity are more probable to complete certain kinds of activities on our platform or are more probable to actually you know, um, consistently exercise or something to that effect? Um, I think there's this really wonderful space in healthcare, which is between, you know, a very traditional wellness angle and chronic condition management that's ripe for disruption. And it's really where at risk and individuals, if you can get them to start adopting healthy habits and behavioral change, can lead to enormous impact in terms of long-term cost of care. Um, and I have a particular passion for this because I'm, I'm based in the U.S. actually, but I'm at our Toronto office um, right now. Uh, but in the U.S., you know, our healthcare outcomes are horrific compared to the amount of money that we spend on them. And so, um, and a lot of it really traces back to access to care and how people adopt, you know, behavioral change to actually create healthy habits long-term that prevents them from developing conditions that in many cases can be largely avoided. Um, and so at League, we're really focused on ways that we can make the experience very personalized for users. Um, I will say, you know, having come from years where really focused on the team building complex models, um, our style is like start simple. Um, and we want to be building things that actually deliver value for users. If it doesn't need to be complicated, if it's even a simple rules engine, that's fine, as long as we're getting some sense of what the engagement from our user is. I think similarly to the points Ava made, like if you're doing a statistical analysis, don't jump straight to a neural network when like logistic regression is perfectly effective. Um, and I think that that experience I had during my time at Amgen has been really beneficial coming to League, um, especially when you know our jobs here are not to build really complicated models, our jobs are making the experience delightful for our consumers. Great, thank you for sharing. So we have a lot of different use cases uh, across health and different kinds of organizations here. So maybe you could share a little bit more about your own team and organization's role within health and some of the career pathways and opportunities you see emerging in your organization um, who would be working on some of the projects that we've mentioned here today. Um, what attributes would make a team member great uh, and what could students do to develop or hone these kinds of skill sets to be successful in your team? Uh, so maybe I will start with uh, Mike. Uh, sure. So as I describe our our end to end supply chain across the whole company, uh, we kind of need everything, <laughs> right? From your uh, data scientists, data engineers, your uh, full stack developers, your um, uh, UX designers, you name it, right? Um, digital is really transforming. Um, everything uh, across all domains of the research, deployment, et cetera, um, uh, and, and, and customer engagement and, and so on. So um, there's, there's a full range of, uh, of needs. So what, what makes a, a, a good teammate? Well, it really depends on, on the role you're looking for. I think uh, fundamental is just be a good person that people want to work with. <laughs> and uh, so hopefully you're all there. Um, and uh, you know, then one, there's the technical skills. Um, obviously, that's a great starting point, especially when you're starting out in your career. Um, you probably actually are, are know more about the leading edge um, than many people on the team that you're going to be joining. Um, but they will know a lot more about what actually works in practice. And you don't always need to be leading edge. You need to bring something forward um, that is going to work uh, and that has the potential to grow. Uh, and meet um, end users' needs at the end of the day. So that awareness of what you're trying to develop doesn't, it's not the, the super fancy, sophisticated, complicated thing that you might publish about, but it's something that um, you know a clinician or a patient or somebody will pick up and say, this is amazing and totally changes how I approach my work and makes things a lot easier for me. So, um, so that, that open-mindedness awareness is, is certainly critical. Yeah, that's a really great um, tip for students. How about you, Farnoosh? Uh, let's say that in our company, uh, there are lots of uh, scientific uh, people and also chemists and uh, structural biostats and also computer scientists. But I would like to just talk about my experience that uh, I, I'm sure that it would be helpful because uh, I didn't, before I, uh, before I, got, I get a start and working on a healthcare, I didn't have any information about the healthcare data, bioinformatics, and also genomics and radiomics uh, at the time that I get a start at my postdoc. And it was a pair that, uh, 
when you don't know anything about that, you cannot be successful in this field. But uh, I think that uh, I need to say that if you want to work in uh, the, the data science, it's really important to be sure that you can learn about that. You can learn about uh, for, uh, proteins, you can learn more about the drugs and these structures. And don't be afraid of any of these uh, things and try to dig in and get started working on that, if, even if you don't have any information about those things. But uh, learning more about that and preparing yourself is an access. Yeah, that's a great tip as well. Um, how about you, Saba? Yeah, so, um, I mean, I have a very small team within Ontario, also the only team that, I mean, I guess formally does data science. And I mean, again, data science, getting insights from data, I would say many teams within Ontario Health are generating insights from data. So it's also, I feel like sometimes the titles and team names can be kind of off-putting for people, but I mean, there are many, many ways of using analytics within, again, planning for the healthcare system. The use cases are very different as, as we heard from, from other panelists. Um, uh, the, so what, uh, like, I'm gonna just talk a little bit about the team. So we have data scientists, which in fact are more junior staff joining the team. And we have a decision scientists that are kind of a more senior version of the data scientists. So again, you, you want people that can code, that understand the data, that know methodology, we have also, it's a multidisciplinary team. So we have operations research, biostats and health economics right now. But really what I would say I look for is for, for the more junior team member, you wanna be technically really strong and you wanna kind of come in and just be willing to learn. And you do not need to come from a background of health. Like my background was industrial engineering and then forest resource management and then healthcare. So it was completely like a really weird way of getting into health. We've also hired from non like from finance, from physics, from other kind of backgrounds. So I would say being willing to learn uh, is 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 important, and really having that. Initially, you just really need to be technically strong and just be willing to learn and just play ball with the other team members. Once you come in, I would say like we've also heard from uh, from us before, like kind of learning, like a defined kind of like if you think about the double diamond process. So you want to kind of be able to um, understand the challenge, so understand the problem, like defining or scoping the question is actually the biggest part of the problem most of the time. So, so we get usually vague questions around, we have some issues around capacity of whatever, like what is it that you actually, what is the decision you're trying to make so that we can give you an analytical tool or a prediction or a recommendation that can actually help you make that decision. So that's what we look for kind of as people mature in their roles anywhere in the organization, so within my team or anywhere else, is to really understand what is the question that's being asked and can you help your client actually kind of make or ask the right question. And once you have that, then you can obviously go through like how you actually make a solution that for that specific question. Um, and that's uh, that's what is actually pretty hard to come by. So you get a lot of people that are technically strong, they cannot work through the vagueness, they cannot work through messy data, they, you know, you have to kind of, just again, being within a large organization of, I don't know, 10,000 plus people, just knowing, you know, how to deal with people, how to make friends along the way. And you have to work with privacy, you have to work with security, you have to work with all these different teams within the organization. Um, so just really understanding the context around the questions that come. So not just the, the technical, but again, I would, look, I think to begin with, work on your, obviously work on the presentation skills, work on that kind of the overall soft skills, but being technically strong is a good place to start. Like I think you don't need to know all, everything on the first day of your job, you will learn that, uh, but the, the technical infrastructure, like kind of the, the technical kind of foundational skills, you need to know that you cannot necessarily learn that on the job, you know. Right, so I think that we're seeing some themes across the board where like the open-mindedness, be technically strong, but you don't have to necessarily have all the subject matter expertise. Um, what are your thoughts on this, Carrie? Yeah, so um, I guess, you know, one key core skill that I think anyone who's in data science absolutely needs to have is uh, data engineering and SQL skills and tenacity to deal with extremely messy data. 
Um, and whether you have familiarity in the health space or not, a big challenge I've seen when folks come from um, grad school or even undergrad and started a company is like, oh, the data that we work with, I have to wrangle that. Oh, it's not a result that I expected. Um, that's what real life data is like. And I actually think that that's a really cool experience to have. Um, and it's what has attracted me to the you know, biological and health field in the first place is that it's a highly stochastic system. People, humans do not behave in logical ways. And so um, you know, I think it's a cool opportunity to actually work with that data. But what often happens is you know, um, I think team members are surprised by the amount of data, data wrangling that they need to do. Um, and the reality is like, I think that you're not a good data scientist if you're not able to do that. You learn a lot of really interesting signals when you start observing how humans are behaving in your system. Um, and so I, I think that that is one area that I in particular think is extremely important. Um, I noticed, I'll just maybe tie, tie this in because somebody asked it in the chat. Um, I do not think that you need to have, I mean, I'll, I should be more specific. It depends on the company, whether you really need to have a health background. It also depends on the specific role. Um, and uh, this is my experience, at least at Amgen, in some parts of Amgen. Um, certainly, if you're working on production of like a chemical reaction, it is extremely helpful to have a chemical engineering background. Um, but I had team members that had no background in biology working at our subsidiary in Iceland on genetics. Um, at League, all of our data is generated by users on how they interact on our platform. Um, and as a user, we, you know, our um, our employees get to use our app um, as in our B two B version. Um, and so we have an understanding of what's being generated on our platform itself. So at least in like the digital health space, I think it's pretty rare for someone to need to have a health or biology background. Um, and I think it's so valuable to have team members that come from very diverse backgrounds because it opens up the kinds of methodologies that you might think about. If you have someone who has a signal processing background, they might immediately see time series and think oh, Fourier transforms versus somebody who's more a background in image processing you might be thinking of CNNs or something. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of value, or I'll give that one last example, survival analysis for churn, for churn in, on, on a platform. Um, survival analysis is extremely common for studying clinical trials. Um, so I, I think there's so much value in having a very diverse team in terms of the background and skill set that the team members are bringing to the table. Yeah, that's really great insight. Um, I see Saba's nodding a lot. Do you want to add anything to that piece? I would say, I was just going to say like health admin data also, like we use a lot of health admin data to make almost like as a proxy for clinical data sometimes, because we don't necessarily have access to HRs or EMRs at all. So I would, I wanted to say like messiness of the data, data engineering, just like SQL will save you. Like you just need to know it. It's, I mean, actually like 80% of the time of people within our team is like, just figure out the data and like, you know, then you just run or fit this model to it and you make the prediction or whatever. And then, and then like, a lot of the time also like literally slide decks until you die like just like once you create the model then you have to present it to like a million people to just like explain the results so the actual like fitting the model i would say is like a really really tiny piece of all the time that you have to spend understanding the data the context like wrangle it get it into a format where you can kind of fit the data so absolutely just wanted to say that's definitely my experience and you need to just kind of accept that that's it's not like you come in somebody gives you the data and you just fit the model to it you have to kind of be able to do things end to end most of the time yeah hundred percent um mike and furnish do you have anything to add on the role of people without a biological or health background on your team yeah i, I mean that's like great points by sad and carry i think i'd add into that um uh in, in health, you don't always have the wealth of data that you might have had in your um, in your training. Uh, you pull social media data, for example, and there's there's as much as you can possibly want to ever work with. Whereas, even the most advanced um, you know clinical trial program will have a tiny fraction of that data to work from. So dealing with small volumes of data is is a different kind of a challenge. Um, and then also um, the the ethical frameworks around um, uh, data science and healthcare. I think um, privacy concerns are extremely um, acute in, in, in healthcare. And so you need to be very um, aware of what's the appropriate use of data and how do you um, how do you govern your data and your processes effectively. So even not knowing anything about the data that's feeding into models, um, um, having a really strong sense for how you manage and govern your data and processes uh, is extremely key uh, to, to being successful in whatever you develop. 
That sounds good. Uh, Farnoosh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I just want to add something, uh, some small thing. Uh, let's say that the desire of learning is much more important than what you already know about the data. And uh, the patient, uh, be patient about learning and uh, knowing that data is really important. And don't be afraid if you just be in meetings that uh, there are um, biologists uh, talking about some concept that you don't know anything about that. that. Uh, it's happened that you just be in some meetings that there are some subjects that you don't know anything about that. Be patient and try to learn. Really great advice that's being shared here today. Uh, we have time for one quick question at the very end that Mike already touched on. So you all work in a sector where privacy, confidentiality, ethical AI, all of those things are very, very important. So what are some regulatory or ethical issues that graduating students should be aware of? Um, and how do you address these within specific projects or your work more broadly? Um, and if there's any resources you would like to point to, um, you can do that as well. So since Mike brought it up first, I'll throw it over to Mike first. Yeah, put me on the spot. Uh, I, I don't know that I have a good resource top of mind. Um, uh, so we obviously, we have all sorts of guiding principles we have internally. Um, uh, you can read on the, I mean, it's, it's a rapidly evolving domain. In fact, I'm involved with the Vector Institute right now on a trustworthy AI uh, project, which is really interesting learning across industries. Um, I think the finance sector is a great place to look at for learnings about how do you manage data in a trustworthy way uh, they've been doing it for years, not necessarily through AI, but um, as, as, a, as, a, um, as a broad industry and, and healthcare needs to catch up. Um, so federated learning is, is all the talk these days. Um, for those who are fans of it, there are others that are not huge fans of federated technologies for, for various reasons. And so how else do you manage um, appropriate sharing of data so you can get the scaled data sets that you actually need to be able to develop some models and sustain some models um, without um, disclosing potentially private information or sharing information outside of institutions where it resides, respecting uh, data ownership, et cetera. Um, so, um, you know, reading up on that, on the leading edge of, of privacy preserving technologies, I think is a, is a good starting point when you're thinking about uh, AI in, in healthcare. Yeah, that seems very important. Uh, Saba, I see you again nodding, so maybe you can follow up on that. Sorry, I feel like this is like my daily life. Yeah, so the, like in terms of privacy, um, Concerns, like I want to say again, as, as the provincial agency that holds a lot of administrative data, like we deal with this um, kind of uh, every day in terms of kind of using the data for any purpose needs to go through a whole process of getting approval. So we've, as I said, like we haven't really done like many ML or AI type projects. So like the whole like ethics of AI hasn't been addressed really at, at Ontario Health. It's a concern that as we are trying to, as I said, build some partnerships, external partnerships, a uh, really a big concern that our privacy team has is around ethics of AI and how we're going to kind of make sure that the model that we're building to, you know, I don't know, flag such and such patients, like it's actually, you know, the, the model is developed in an ethical way. Not being a data scientist, I can't really speak to that myself. And I think that's where we really lack um, kind of that expertise currently within Ontario Health, we're trying to learn, like our leadership is like, we're trying to kind of, again, partner with vectors, with with, with other kind of academic uh, or um, uh, like other institutes to try to learn from how they would approach that. I would say, as, as Mike said, absolutely a, a kind of a, a growing uh, domain people are trying to learn. And I think um, for us, at least, again, just being super conservative, <laughs> we have that, I feel like that has been a big, barrier to try to move forward and it's a problem and it's actually a problem that can be frustrating at times but totally understand that the kind of the mandate that the organization has and they have to protect the data but it has caused issues in terms of being able to really take the next step in let's build this model let's take our data to this environment and do such and such look like look that has been a huge barrier and i um, I mean, Ontario is absolutely trying to learn and, and grow in that space, but um, I feel like it's not fast enough. So that's that's just my experience. Right. So definitely an opportunity where we can learn more uh, about. Uh, so maybe carry over to you because you work a lot with cus customer data. So maybe a different perspective on that. Yeah, I think my advice is, and, and this has been a philosophy I've, I've long held, is that you should see your privacy and security and compliance functions as your partners, not your adversaries. And I think a lot of new folks, even like leaders that join companies will often see them as like a blocker that they need to get past or see how 
far they can push them. And my perspective is always, they're your partner. Um, and I actually think there's really cool innovations that can happen when you partner closely with your privacy, security, and compliance colleagues. Um, we've been able to architect um, a number of different approaches to um, protect our data, to encrypt it, um, and ensure that we're able to work with it in a really scalable manner. Um, we're definitely doing some exploration into federated learning to support some approaches to analyze data across tenants and across regions. Uh, we have some unique challenges because we um, serve as customers both in Canada and the US and so have data residency requirements to contend with. Um, but I think like they're, they're, I would argue for someone who's new to um, industry, um, I would suggest like the experts are an expert for a reason at your company. And so um, I've seen kind of dangerous behavior where engineers that are really clever, sort of trying to read up on things and try to figure out themselves. There's a reason your company has someone who's that's their responsibility. Um, and I think there's such an opportunity and they would be delighted to be able to partner with engineers and scientists in their company to be able to ensure what the you know policies and procedures are are really lived um, as, a, as a value rather than something that somebody is having to, to adhere to. Yeah, that's really great advice. Um, and last but not least, to close this out, Pranush. Uh, in the case of the uh, privacy of the data, let's say that it depends on the project that you want to work on. Uh, in the last couple of projects that I worked on, uh, I don't have any issue in that. But uh, uh, let's say that uh, you must be aware that you, do, you don't get access to all, uh, all the data because of this privacy, especially whenever you want to work with the patient data. It's not as easy as the other kind of data that you want to work on. And uh, it's uh, sometimes you, the, the way that you want to get access to those data is much more different than the other types. Right, for sure. So thank you to all of our panelists here today. Um, some incredible insights and lots of great advice for all of our